Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this Engaging the Mind program. My name is Susan Lynch. I am the Associate Director of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. I am so pleased that you are joining us today to learn about the Great Migration. We have registrants for this program from 42 states across the country and eight countries around the world. So welcome to everyone participating today. Before starting the program, I wanna provide some quick housekeeping items. If you have a question during the presentation, you may enter it in the webinar Q&A. We have received many questions prior to the live event and we'll take those into consideration as well. You'll find resources in the webinar chat. Please also note this program is being recorded and will be posted in Lifetime Learning's Vodcast Library in about a week or two. Now on to our speaker. Kevin Gaines is the Julian Bond Professor of Civil Rights and Social Justice in the Corcoran Department of History an associate director in the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African-American and African Studies at the University of Virginia. He's also a faculty senior fellow at UVA's Miller Center. He is author of Uplifting the Race, Black Leadership, Politics, and Culture During the 20th Century, which was awarded the American Studies Association's John Hope Franklin Book Prize. His book, Ameri Afri American Africans in Ghana, Black Expatriates and the Civil Rights Era, was a choice outstanding academic title. His current research is on the integrationist projects of African-American activists, artists, and intellectuals. He studies interventions that have redefined blackness and acknowledge the relationship of structural and ideological forms of racism, such as racial capitalism, patriarchy, and homophobia. Another interesting fact from Professor Gaines' bio is that from 1987 to 1991, he was jazz director at WBRU-FM in Providence, Rhode Island, and an on-air host of jazz, blues, and reggae programs. He was also a member of the advisory board of the Detroit Jazz Festival from 2012 to 2018. So thank you again for joining us for this Lifetime Learning Program. Now I'm gonna turn the program over to our esteemed speaker, Professor Gaines, please take it away. Thank you, Susan, for that introduction. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in from the UVA Lifelong Learning Community. Um, and thanks to everyone who has uh, uh, submitted questions in advance. So let me get started here. I've got some slides to share with you. Um, I'm really excited to uh, share this uh, information with you and, and also looking forward to the uh, question and answer period, uh, if all goes well, uh, towards uh, uh, the end of the presentation. So we're talking about the Great Migration. It's, a, it's a, a subject that has had a huge impact on 20th century American history, society, politics, culture. It's a really vast topic. And, and today we're only going to scratch the surface. What you're looking at is a, a, a sort of a, uh, an excerpt or part of uh, a, the Jacob, the African-American artist, Jacob Lawrence's migration series. And this is the first panel of the migration series. It's, it's a, a, a number of, of, uh, of paintings uh, that sort of unfold the narrative of the great migration. Uh, and this panel is, uh, is, uh, is captioned, during World War I, there was a great migration north by Southern African Americans. And uh, one has to wonder if uh, the term, the great migration, was actually coined by uh, Jacob Lawrence in uh, his uh, migration series. So just to set the stage for this moment in uh, the 1910s, uh, by World War I, race relations in the South, and bear in mind that nine out of 10 African-Americans lived in the South at the turn of the century, um, we're, we're, we're pretty dire. We're in the, the post-Reconstruction period. Um, there have been uh, problems with uh, anti-Black violence. Uh, lynching was endemic within the region. And when you get into the, the, the first decade of the 20th century, uh, lynching is even happening outside the South. And there was a notorious lynching uh, in Springfield, Illinois, that was the catalyst for the founding of the NAACP the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And that is, you know, uh, remains uh, a major civil rights organization. 
Um, and you're starting to see in African-American politics uh, after uh, 1915 and the death of Booker T. Washington, a new generation of African-American leadership that is a bit more militant than Washington was and uh, willing to uh, raise their voices in protest uh, against lynching and also against uh, the, the film Birth of a Nation, which was uh, a Hollywood spectacular. It was uh, a, a, a really uh, a, a controversial event that uh, was protested in many Northern cities outside the South. And of course, Birth of the Nation, for those of you who have seen it, uh, basically views the reconstruction and African-American voting and office holding in the South as uh, uh, something that was a, a, a huge mistake uh, and the hero of Birth of a Nation uh, is uh, a member of the, the Ku Klux Klan. So um, it's a very racist interpretation of the, the history of the United States South after emancipation and reconstruction. And so this is the moment at which you, uh, you have uh, African-American migration. Uh, when World War I breaks out, uh, immigra uh, immigration from uh, Europe uh, is shut down uh, by uh, all of the uh, the warfare that's happening in the United in in the Atlantic Ocean, and there's a labor shortage in the in uh, for U.S. industries and sort of northern industries are seeing a huge opportunity to make uh, massive profits during the war, but they have a labor shortage, and so they uh, actually conduct outreach and send African American labor agents south to stimulate that uh, migration. So between, uh, between 1915 and 1918, uh, it should say uh, 500,000 Blacks left the South. Uh, and in uh, a, a, a few years after that, between 1920 and 1930, 1 1.3 million African-Americans left the South. And they, they, they left mostly by train uh, but they hitched rides, they drove, uh, and, and they went to cities. And some of the major destinations of the Black migration, the urban migration, uh, were Chicago, Detroit, New York, and Philadelphia. Uh, eventually, uh, during World War II, in the second wave of the Great Migration, uh, African Americans would go to Los Angeles as well. And they were drawn, they were attracted by this, this opportunity for uh, industrial jobs in the North, but they were also fleeing racial oppression in the South. They were fleeing Jim Crow. And these were laws that were put on the books uh, after Reconstruction uh, to separate Black people and white people in all aspects of uh, public life. Uh, and so Georgia was the first state to demand separate seating for whites and Blacks on streetcars. And then by 1896, that those kinds of state segregation laws were uh, the law of the land through the Supreme Court decision of Plessy v. Ferguson. So um, every aspect of society was 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 uh, segregated. In courthouses, there were separate Bibles. In bars, there were separate sections. In post offices, separate windows. In libraries, separate branches. Uh, so uh, in Birmingham, it was a crime for blacks and whites to play checkers together in a public park. And so you have this uh, massive uh, response to this, this opportunity to flee racism. Uh, and a, a big part of that uh, was the pervasive nature of racial terror lynchings. Between 1890 and 1910, over 1,200 uh, African Americans were lynched, and lynchings were of mostly Black people uh, by generally white mobs in the South. And this was a form of extra legal violence that is a major uh, catalyst for uh, the Great Migration. You also have the economic hardship caused by the sharecropping system, and that is represented in the picture. You have a, a picture of a Mississippi planter posing with uh, some of his workers, and the sharecropping system was. Uh, a system that was designed to ensure that African Americans uh, remained landless, tied to the land, in debt, uh, et cetera. Here you have uh, the Union Terminal, 
uh, which was uh, a segregated waiting room in Jacksonville, Florida. The Union Terminal, uh, the train station in Jacksonville was, was uh, built in 1919. And uh, you can see on the caption the, the, what's written and on the picture, Union Terminal, Terminal, it was then known as the Colored Waiting Room. And that uh, is an example of uh, the segregation that many African-Americans were fleeing. But uh, you, you also get uh, to see the uh, enormous response uh, in this picture as well. So, um, the pathways of migration. There were train lines um, heading up um, south from Florida. We, we just saw the station in Jacksonville, which was a major, probably the largest uh, train station in the south. And you can see um, the folks going up north from, let's say, Jacksonville uh, are stopping off in, in Richmond and then catching trains to other points north. Um, in Mississippi and Alabama, the train lines are uh, going up uh, through to the Midwest, to Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland. And, um, and then you uh, see other uh, pathways of migration. And when you look at this line of migration westward, um, as I said, that is the, um, uh, I, I think most of those people are uh, leaving the South during World War II. And again, they're drawn by opportunities in defense industries uh, on the West Coast. And again, uh, the two waves of African-American migration, um, the first wave coming mostly from the Cotton Belt states of the Deep South, Louisiana, uh, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, et cetera, and heading due north uh, with many uh, heading on to uh, New York uh, and Philadelphia, and then the second wave, which is that lighter color of green, heading west uh, to uh, the West Coast cities and some cities in uh, in the in the middle of the country as well in the in the plains. So what you see is a very sudden and dramatic increase in the African American population in northern cities. Um, if if you can make these numbers out. We'll just look at the top. Obviously, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Detroit are the major cities of the uh, of the Great Migration. Um, and mind you, these are figures uh, as late as 1930. So, in 1910, there are 91,000 over 91,000 African Americans, and then by um, 1930, you see over 300,000. Um, so what you have in most of these places is an exponential increase in the number of African Americans, um, which is a quite um, sudden and uh, development, uh, and it has, as, as we'll see, implications for American politics and society uh, for years to come. So um, mobility had been a feature of African American culture going back to the days of slavery in the South. Um, one of the ways that African-Americans could, uh, could resist the institution of slavery uh, was by exercising um, whatever uh, freedom they had to move about. And of course, that mobility uh, would, would become uh, an even more prominent feature with emancipation as many African-Americans after the end of slavery fled uh, plantations and went to cities. So um, there's a sort of a, a deep history uh, in which migration and mobility are already understood by many African Americans in the South as a, 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 a political response, as a way of, of uh, uh, making a way out of no way. And so Northern migration really had this dramatic impact on Southern and national politics because it gave African-Americans a way out of the, of the stalemate, the political stalemate um, caused by Jim Crow, caused by the political violence and intimidation that had uh, driven African-Americans out of politics. And of, of course, uh, I should mention that Southern states between 1890 and 1908 had systematically uh, removed African-American men 
from the polls, had stripped, stripped the voting rights of African Americans. So African Americans go from uh, voting rights and full participation during Reconstruction um, to no voting rights and losing their elected uh, representatives. And so um, this is uh, in part why historians like to think of migration as political behavior. When you're completely excluded from the political process, um, exit, uh, migration, uh, flight is pretty much the only political response that you've got left. And so you see this illustration of a migrant family from the South arriving in Chicago. And um, a little more, I, I guess, uh, sort of statistical information. Um, the, what, what's fascinating is uh, people, press accounts were noting the Black migration at the time, and they talked about it being a leaderless movement. Uh, it was a movement that, that it was an exodus that lacked a Moses, as, as uh, people used to say in those days. Um, but there was one institution that uh, really had a stake in the migration and was actively promoting it, and that was a Black-owned newspaper called the Chicago Defender. And uh, the Chicago Defender was owned by a man uh, named Robert Abbott, who was a migrant himself. He had come to Chicago from Virginia in the 1890s. He was part of an earlier wave of Black migration in which really the only folks who are migrating are professionals and people you know, with, with uh, uh, skills uh, that, uh, that make it possible for them to sort of gain an economic foothold within a Northern society that, you know, uh, within which there's, there's still a fair amount of discrimination. So Abbott used to publish the letters of migrants in his newspaper, the Chicago Defender. And then Abbott wanted to circulate uh, his newspaper. It was, this was a weekly African-American owned newspaper. He wanted to circulate it to the deep South um, so that, you know, um, uh, black folks living there could get the word, uh, and he was actively encouraging the migration. So this is uh, from a, I guess it's an editorial, Frozen Death Better. Um, to die from the bite of frost is far more glorious than that of the mob. I beg of you, my brothers, to leave that benighted land. You are free men. Show the world that you will not let false leaders lead you. Your neck has been in the yoke. Will you keep it there because some white folks uh, and, and in those days, uh, the, the, there was, and, and particularly to that audience, uh, you know, there was a certain amount of bluntness about uh, the, uh, the, the, the nature of uh, the uh, plight of Black people. Uh, because some white folks, uh, N-word, wants you to get out of the South. You're being there in numbers, uh, in the numbers you are, gives the Southern politician too strong a hold on your progress. And this is a kind of an old idea within African American politics that um, African Americans leaving the South, um, withdrawing their labor power and withdrawing their uh, consumer spending was probably the surest way to hit at um, white Southern municipal authorities who were, you know, indifferent to the problems of lynching and. Uh, lawlessness that were rampaging in the South. Oh, I, I should just uh, show uh, this ca cartoon, The Awakening. It shows, uh, uh, I guess, a black farmhand who is has been asleep on a bale of cotton and is awakening and uh, I, I guess about to catch the next thing smoking uh, uh, for a Northern city. Um, here's a letter from a migrant. Uh, and uh, I think you can get an idea of, of the historical moment. Uh, I, I do feel so fine with the aid of God. I am making very good. Uh, I make $75 per month. Don't have to mister every little white boy comes along. And you get a sense of the sort of the customs of Jim Crow, the sort of the, the enforced deference of, of, uh, of Black uh, men and women to, to any white person, even, uh, you know, uh, a, a child, don't have to mister every little white boy comes along. I haven't heard a white man call a colored an N-word since I've been in the state of Pennsylvania. I can ride in the electric street and steam cars when I get a seat. 
I'm not crazy about being with white folks, but I have to pay the same, if I have to pay the same fare, I have learned to want the same accommodation. And if you're in a place shopping, you don't have to wait until all the white folks get through trading. Yet amid all this, I shall ever love the good old South. And I'm praying that God may give every well-wisher a chance to be a man, regardless of his color. And if my going to the front would bring about such conditions, I'm ready any day. The kids are in school every day. And what's really interesting about this is you really get the, the context of World War I and a fair amount of identification with uh, the national interest in the war and patriotism uh, expressed uh, by this, uh, this, this individual. Okay. Okay. So during the Great Migration, the issue of whether or not African Americans were going to serve in uh, with with the, the U.S. Uh, arose as the United States was preparing to enter uh, the conflict in in Europe, and um, as you can see there, there was a tremendous response. Four hundred thousand African Americans registered for military service. Um, the U.S. Army was segregated at that time. Uh, of course, the Marines banned African Americans. Um, African Americans in the military suffered from uh, the prejudice of white officers and many white troops. Bear in mind, many of the white troops are from the South. Um, and over 100,000 served overseas. And here you have a picture of a, a training camp for, for Black officers in Georgia. Um, African Americans, most African Americans, uh, were laborers and provided labor support during the war, um, but there were um, over 100,000 who served in combat. All right, now the Black migration created these, uh, quite suddenly, um, substantial African-American communities, and they tended to be segregated. Um, you have a cluster of African-Americans uh, and, and a neighborhood forming in the south side of Chicago and the west side of Chicago. And the uh, emergence of these large black communities in cities like Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, uh, et cetera, created a need. And so you, what you saw was the emergence of a group of black professionals and entrepreneurs who are catering to the needs of these black communities. And there's a very interesting figure named Jesse Binga who was a banker in Chicago. He established uh, an African-American owned uh, bank and was also involved in uh, real estate. Um, a lot of these entrepreneurs were uh, engaged in you know, providing services for African-Americans that wouldn't, were not provided uh, by other businesses. So they built banks, insurance companies, newspapers, hotels, restaurants, theaters, other businesses, places of leisure, et cetera. And Binga was uh, uh, a migrant. Well, he actually, his family is from Detroit. He came to Chicago in the 1890s with virtually nothing. And by 1908, he had founded uh, the Binga Bank, which was Chicago's first black owned bank. Um, and he was a missionary for black wealth. He was very conspicuous with his success and that, um, uh, attracted uh, white hostility and resentment, even violence. Uh, his home was bombed six times. His businesses were uh, his business was bombed twice, and he was constantly threatened. Uh, he lost his fortune in the Great Depression in uh, the 1930s. There were cultural entrepreneurs like the filmmaker Oscar Micheaux, who is known as the founder of independent black cinema. Uh, Micheaux was an extraordinary figure. Um, he was a migrant to Chicago, and he, he sensed that Black audiences wanted to see movies. This is, uh, you know, the, uh, obviously the film industry is based in Hollywood at this time, but um, Michelle rightly sensed that African-American audiences wanted to see films made with Black casts, made by Black filmmakers, and, and basically dealing with Black stories. And so uh, he made 30 movies. He was uh, he never amassed great wealth, but he was able to keep working. Uh, uh, just a, a really innovative figure and marketer. Uh, and he um, 
Only a few of his films are extant, and, and this is one of them. Um, his 1925 film, Body and Soul, was the film debut of Paul Robeson, uh, who uh, went on to uh, become um, a major singer, actor, entertainer, uh, an activist in the 20th century. And another major uh, cultural entrepreneur who is uh, really responding to the needs of migrants for, uh, you know, just con consumer culture, consumer goods was Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was the first self-made woman millionaire. And uh, she was a cosmetics uh, uh, executive. She was involved in the beauty culture industry, as were uh, many, you know, white women uh, uh, entrepreneurs. But uh, she was born in Louisiana um, uh, in a sharecropper's cabin. She was widowed at 20. Uh, she moved to St. Louis with $2 and a dream. She, li she, she literally dreamed the, the sort of the, the chemical uh, combination for hair care products. Uh, and um, it became a phenomenal uh, success for her. At, at her peak, the annual gross income from the sale of her preparations was $50,000. She built mansions in Harlem and then on the Hudson River. Uh, and she was uh, very politically active as well. And it's very important to, to think of these people as more than just successful Black business people. They were involved in politics. They were involved in supporting culture. Madam C.J. Walker's daughter was a... Uh, a philanthropist and a supporter of many of the Harlem Renaissance African American writers. So, so these folks are involved in many different aspects of society and really contributing to uh, the struggles of African Americans uh, in many ways. Okay, um, the impact on American literature. Richard Wright uh, was from Mississippi. He was uh, the son of a sharecropper father and a school teacher mother. Uh, he, the family moved, the, the father abandoned uh, the, the family, but the family moved to Jackson, Mississippi, and then Richard Wright goes to Chicago in 1925. He wrote about uh, arriving in Chicago and being just completely overwhelmed and, and really kind of uh, very uneasy about migration. You really have to imagine uh, how difficult it, it must have been for some people to leave home, family, everything that they had known for the, the unknown uh, you know, uh, uncertain uh, possibilities in the city. Also, Zora Neale Hurston, a uh, prominent African-American writer from Eatonville, Florida, during the 1920s. She got her doctorate in anthropology from Columbia University. And during that time, she was fraternizing with some of the Harlem Renaissance writers like uh, Langston Hughes in, in Harlem uh, and writing short stories and novels. And of course, she's best known perhaps for her novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And then the Great Migration is, uh, it changes culture in terms of uh, uh, music as well. And so what you have is this tremendous exodus of many uh, legendary landmark blues musicians, Delta blues musicians from the Mississippi Delta. Um, you know, just the, 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 the number of great musicians who came from a single plantation in the Mississippi Delta, the Dockery Plantation, is quite staggering. Charlie Patton uh, and, and then his protege, Howlin' Wolf, uh, his real name is, Howlin' Wolf is a stage name, his real name is Chester Burnett. Uh, and then, of course, Muddy Waters. And we know that Muddy Waters uh, and the Chicago blues, the sort of the urban electric blues uh, uh, that was uh, many of these artists uh, recorded with chess records, would be a huge inspiration for many British rock and roll artists. Okay, you also had uh, other blues artists, uh, Bessie Smith, the Empress of the Blues. Uh, her music was immensely popular among migrants from Chicago. She recorded for Columbia Records. She uh, was based in the South and she toured uh, constantly throughout the South uh, and someone who was very influential for subsequent American popular music. Now, the, the, the Great Migration affected a huge change in African-American politics. Uh, and historians refer to this as the New Negro. And the, the, the slogan, the New Negro, 
comes from the African-American press. And you can think of the New Negro as a, as a political, social, and cultural protest movement. Uh, and the New Negro affected a change in Black leadership. Booker T. Washington, who was the most powerful Black Southern leader, dies in 1915, and it creates a vacuum. And other leaders come to the fore who are more protest oriented. You have black nationalists like Marcus Garvey. Uh, you have socialists and radicals like A. Philip Randolph and, uh, and others. And you also have the, the, the literary and cultural modernism of the Harlem Renaissance, which, you know, Alain Locke, the African-American intellectual, collected a bunch of writing um, by black intellectuals and, and, and writers and called it the New Negro. And, and also black students uh, at historically black colleges uh, stage a wave of protests against with the conservatism of their administration. So there's a militant movement afoot and this is really described by the kind of the catch all term New Negro. This is a, a Garveyite parade. Um, one of the things that you really see a lot is African-Americans taking to the streets, particularly in places like Harlem. Uh, and this is a Garveyite parade. And it's just a public manifestation of a spirit of protest and a spirit of, uh, you know, uh, self-determination and an uh, unwillingness to, uh, to compromise on issues of their, uh, their rights and freedom. Uh, you see the car bearing the, the, the slogan, the new Negro has no fear. And then this is a period, as, as I mentioned, where African-Americans are fighting in World War II, and they're fighting in this war to save democracy. Uh, and, and so when they come home to the United States, uh, and, and, and they're, they're, they're painfully aware of the ironies of this because they're fighting in a segregated US Army, those African-American troops who actually see combat in Europe are not fighting under US command, they're fighting under French command. and so. They're fighting for democracy, and many of them come home to the United States, and they insist on uh, enjoying democracy there. Uh, here are some African Americans who were decorated by France. They received the Croix de Guerre. Uh, and here is uh, a massive manifestation of, uh, you know, I, I guess, African American uh, uh, sort of political aspirations for power and for organization. Uh, the 369th Infantry. Uh, marches up through New York on Fifth Avenue, starting from Midtown. Uh, looks like they're they're near Central Park at this point, and they're heading to Harlem, and they're going to be ecstatically received by crowds of African American Harlemites. Now, this is a time of tremendous racial polarization in the United States, and uh, as African American veterans return from uh, overseas. Um, many of them are lynched in, uh, in the South. There's, a, there's an uptick of lynchings in the South. Something like six, over 60 African-American veterans are lynched in the South. And part of it is because, you know, there's a, a, a sort of, a, I think, an understanding among uh, the white South that these men have been abroad, they have been ruined. And they're, you know, they're, there's, they really, uh, uh, they interfere with this project of, of segregation, of keeping African-Americans uh, compliant and in their place. And so you have a lot of violence in the South, but you also have in the summer of uh, 1919, a wave of protests. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not, well, well, well anti-Black violence. And when we're talking about race riots, we're talking about white mobs invading Black neighborhoods in these places um, and um, laying siege to black uh, uh, owned property, churches, homes, and um, wreaking violence, bodily harm on any black person un unlucky enough to cross the mob's path. And the worst race riot was in Chicago. It lasted for a few days. The riot was touched off uh, during a hot Chicago summer when a young black youth, Eugene Williams, was stoned to death. Uh, Williams was bathing in Lake Michigan, and he uh, was uh, he, uh, white bathers. The, the beach was segregated in Chicago, and white bathers uh, objected that Williams seemed to have floated from uh, uh, in Lake Michigan 
past the line that separated black and white bathers. And so he was stoned and then fights broke out on the beach and, and spread and escalated throughout the city. Um, and here you have an image of a black veteran confronting a, a, a Illinois state militia man who was brought in to restore order. Now, the new Negro term, the new Negro as a sort of a term and a political slogan gets traction in the African-American press. And I just, I'd like to show this slide because there's kind of, there's a Virginia connection. Robert Curlin was a U.S. chaplain uh, in uh, the, the U.S. Army, and he taught English at VMI. Uh, and he was interested in um, African-American press and public opinion. And so he did a, uh, he compiled a book uh, from clippings from the black press to really sort of get a, a sort of a, a more accurate fix on the sentiments of black people at that time. And he called it the voice of the Negro. It's an incredible resource. Uh, and um, he was, uh, Curlin was a member of the NAACP. He was uh, uh, someone who uh, protested injustice. And uh, during the red summer of 1919, there was a, a massacre of African-American sharecroppers who were trying to organize into a union in uh, Elaine, Arkansas. He wrote an open letter of protest against um, the massacre, calling for justice uh, for the, the, the men killed in, in Arkansas and uh, those arrested, and VMI fired him. And you also get a sense of the impact of the times and the new Negro militancy in some of the literature. Um, Claude McKay was a novelist. He's from Jamaica, and he actually illustrates another aspect of the Great Migration. During World, World War I, uh, immigration is closed. Uh, uh, you know, transatlantic immigration from Europe is closed off, but immigration from the Americas is still happening and is still very much, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> available to folks from the Caribbean, like Claude McKay, who comes to the United States from Jamaica um, to study, to be, a, a, I guess, an agronomist. But he becomes a poet, and uh, he, he is part of the Harlem Renaissance, and he writes this poem, If We Must Die, which is much anthologized in the Black press. Um, it's a really important poem, uh, kind of legendary. Uh, there's an apocryphal story that Winston Churchill actually read it to uh, over the radio to the British public during the Blitz when, uh, when uh, uh, Britain was being besieged by uh, the Nazis. But uh, it's, it's a poem that is really inspired by the fact that um, in some of these uh, race riots during the, uh, the, the Red Summer, African-Americans organized armed resistance and many black veterans were, were involved in, in, in that attempt to protect black communities from invading mobs. Uh, I mean, if We Must Die <laughs> is the poem that makes me a poet among colored Americans. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious pot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead. Oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave and for their thousand blows, deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave, like men we'll face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. Okay. Uh, Claude McKay is going to continue. Or... All right. Yeah, I guess he was not to be denied, uh, Claude McKay. Um, this poem was widely reprinted in the African-American press, and it really, for a lot of African-Americans, caught that spirit of new Negro militancy and, and protest. Okay, um, the Great Migration, as I said, ended this political stalemate that African-Americans were facing in the South. Um, the, the South, under Jim Crow, had turned into a one-party system. 
And so um, the last African-American elected to Congress during Reconstruction, uh, his term ended in 1901. But what happens is the, this major uh, sort of shift of African-Americans forming these quite substantial black communities in cities in the North and the Midwest. Um, African-Americans had been denied voting rights in the South. Upon arrival in these Northern cities, uh, they, are, they have the right to vote and they begin voting and electing their own representatives. So Oscar Depressed uh, is the first uh, black member of Congress uh, since 1901, elected in Chicago. There are other Black uh, prominent Congress le leaders in, in, in Congress. Adam Clayton Powell is elected to Congress in Harlem in, the 19, uh, in 1941, I believe. And he becomes, through his seniority, the most powerful Black man in American politics. So um, African Americans, as a unified voting bloc, were able to influence the outcome of statewide and eventually national elections. Now, at the early in the early 20th century, African Americans are voting as Republicans. During Ro Roosevelt's administration, the party affiliation and 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 I guess loyalty of African Americans shifts to the Democratic Party. For the first time during Roosevelt's election, I believe in 1936, a majority of African Americans vote for the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party is a, is a split party. There's a Northern Democratic Party, which is open to, which is more moderate and liberal, open to African-American politicians. And then there's the Southern Democratic Party, which is the white supremacist, whites only, um, pro-segregation uh, Democratic Party. Now, African-Americans uh, activists um, in the NAACP are noting the political impact of the, of the Great Migration and realizing that African-Americans, the substantial voting blocks of African-Americans in Northern states like Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, uh, et cetera, gives African-Americans some leverage, some political leverage in state and even national politics. And so Henry Lee Moon, uh, an NAACP leader, writes a book in the 1940s, basically promoting that idea that African-Americans can be swing voters in uh, national elections. And in 1946, the Democratic Party, of course, Harry Truman is the leader of the Democratic Party. He uh, becomes president after the death of, uh, of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, the Democrats lost both houses of Congress in the midterm elections. And so Harry, Harry Truman decided to go for that African-American vote. He establishes a civil rights commission that uh, leads to a report called To Secure This Rights these rights and the Democratic Party under the leadership of uh, Minnesota Senator Hubert Humphrey basically accepts every part of the African-American civil rights agenda. Um, so Truman asked Congress for anti-lynching legislation, a permanent fair employment practices committee, a ban on discrimination in interstate travel uh, and anti-poll tax legislation. And so, Basically, this is a bid for African American support, and and you you see this iconic photo of Truman winning an election that many people thought he was going to lose. Uh, Sixty nine percent of uh, the African American uh, vote went to Truman, and some people think that that might have been decisive in a very close election. Okay, we're just winding up now. Um, and you think about the plight of African Americans when Du Bois was writing in 1903, and he's talking about the struggle for African Americans to be recognized as American citizenship citizens. Um, and he says, this then is the end of the American Negro striving. He's using the language of, of, of the time. To be a co-worker in a kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, to husband and use his best powers and latent genius. I, I would argue that the Great Migration um, created the conditions to make Du Bois' sort of aspiration for full African-American citizenship, participation in uh, America's democracy, uh, a reality. Um, and so just we'll end on the note, uh, just, just to emphasize a few points that African-Americans through the Great Migration, transformed American politics, society, and culture. Uh, 
The exodus to northern cities enabled their belated entry into the American industrial working class and the growing labor movement. Uh, and then, of course, African Americans who migrated, their children gained access to public education, uh, a major driver of social mobility, also, you know, a major source of new generations of, of African American leadership. Um, in northern states, African American migrants gained voting rights and were able to elect their own representatives. African Americans re-entered electoral politics uh, after being excluded from them after Reconstruction. Uh, and th those African Americans in the North who could vote were acting politically on behalf of those who were still disenfranchised in the South. And this is an incremental step uh, towards multiracial democracy. So African American migrants also changed American culture through literature and music, the blues, jazz, and gospel music performed by Black Southerners would transform American popular music. And by the mid 20th century, people all over the world are um, tapping into the appeal of African-American music and culture. And so all of these social, political, and cultural changes laid the foundation for the modern civil rights music movement and the dismantling of the South's system of state-supported Jim Crow. But uh, as we all know, the struggle for American democracy it continues and uh, African-Americans are going to be at the center of uh, that struggle. Um, so that's all I have uh, in, in, as part of my formal presentation. I'm very excited to entertain questions uh, from, from uh, you all in the time that remains. Thank you so much, Professor Gaines. That was just a wonderful presentation and so much information there. Um, you know, we'll have a question that came in prior uh, during the registration. Michael Royster, who is an alum, asked, could you talk about the efforts that leaders in the South undertook to try to prevent Black folks from leaving the South? So what sort of uh, things did they encounter as they tried to leave? Yeah, from, from the standpoint of, of, uh, of white politicians, and landowners in the South who were very concerned about controlling African-American labor and keeping them on the plantations to produce the cotton crop. Um, migration was uh, a bad word. Migration was something that needed to be prevented. And there, it, it, you know, even, even though it's not on the level of the Great Migration, attempts uh, at mobility, attempts at emigration to Africa, for example, uh, were, you know, did not sit well with African, with, with, with white uh, plantation owners, landowners in the South. And during the Great Migration, there was an effort uh, to use the political power of uh, Southern politicians to stop that. Um, in some Southern states, they took control of the U.S. mail to try to uh, to prevent the spread of information that would, would sort of encourage Black Southerners to migrate. The Chicago Defender was, was, uh, was seen as contraband, and it was, it was sort of banned throughout the South. Um, and some Southern states would act actually pass laws, or, or cities pass laws, to make it illegal for African Americans to board trains if they had uh, had a prepaid ticket. So there are all kinds of, of sort of um, uh, legal maneuvers that were attempted to, to try to prevent migration. Um, some of the Southern Black leaders, I think that one of the, the, the previous slides, the editorial from the Chicago Defender, also talked about the role of Black leaders. Um, a lot of white leaders are putting pressure on Black civic leaders, ministers, et cetera, to try to discourage the idea of, of, of uh, migration. So there's a certain amount of political pressure being put on migration. I'll just tell you, my both sides of my family uh, were, were uh, products of the Great Migration. My mother's side of the family, my grandfather, his family migrated from Florida um, around the time of World War I, and, and um, they left in the cover of darkness because there was a lot of <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, official, informal, but also, um, you know, maybe, you know, 
informal vigilante efforts to try to to discourage that kind of uh, migration. So to sort of piggyback off of that, uh, Guinevere Debris, who's a parent, um, asked the question. So once people were on their way and on, uh, what was the biggest threats to them reaching their destination? You know, is it a were there block people that were trying to block them along the way during their travels, and and what was that like? I'm not I'm not aware of that. I mean, I think that once you've boarded the train, um, you know, I think the major challenge would be riding in segregated train cars. Um, but uh, you know, I I I'm not aware of of uh, people being impeded. Naturally, if you if you hitched a ride, if you're if you're you know, trying to drive or something like that, then the risks are greater. But um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's just not, uh, there's just not a lot of examples of people, you know, um, encountering that kind of interference once they, they've boarded the train. Okay, great. Uh, Tim Roberts asked the question, um, did uh, African-American community, communities also develop along the migration routes? So to the Northern and Western cities as part of this process? Yeah, I mean, the thing about, we're, we're just talking about the Great Migration, and it's sort of defined as the migration to the northern cities outside the South, but there had also been urban migration within the South, and, and a rural to urban migration within the South, and Richard Wright was an example of that. Um, you know, they didn't go, Richard Wright didn't go from Chicago directly, you know, uh, from Mississippi. Uh, the family stopped off in Jackson. And Richard Wright spent some of his, uh, you know, um, childhood in Jackson, where, um, you know, he he was able to trick the librarian at the public library, the, se the segregated public library in Jackson that didn't loan books to African Americans. He was able to trick the librarian to loan him books. Uh, he told he told the librarian that he was getting them for, you know, a white person. So Richard Wright, you know, very. Uh, inventive uh, at an early age uh, in, in his pursuit of literacy and, and education. So yes, the, 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 there is definitely a uh, these different stages of, of the Great Migration, uh, or, or, or let's just say urban migration, in which the destination was cities in the Upper South, cities like Norfolk or, um, or Richmond or uh, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, B.B. Um, King, the blues musician, migrated to Memphis from the Mississippi plantation. Uh, and there is another uh, great uh, Mississippi musician, Elvis Presley, uh, who did the same. He migrated from Mississippi to, uh, from, yeah, Tupelo, Mississippi to Memphis as well. And that's where he got his start. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. So many people have been asking about, um, is there a reverse migration going on uh, of black movement from the North to the South now? There is, um, I think uh, that's been noted uh, in the census, uh, the 2010 census, we have evidence of tens of thousands of folks who have had moved from uh, you know, these these northern cities that had been, you know, key destinations for the Great Migration, uh, New York, Chicago, Detroit, etc. Um, and, you know, they're, they're moved, they're migrating to southern cities, uh, like Washington, DC, Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, uh, other places. And, you know, there's a sense that the uh, the cost of living in these northern cities, the persistence of, of discrimination, uh, police brutality, et cetera, has, has, has sort of fueled this reverse migration. And it's been happening over the, the past uh, few years or so. Um, and, and there are some people who are actually promoting the idea of reverse migration. If you think about the impact that reverse migration has had and could have on states like Georgia, uh, in which you have a, um, a larger and younger African-American population uh, who are shifting that state's demographics and also shifting that state's politics. Um, 
you know, it's 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 a really striking development. Um, it's not happening in the same magnitude or with the same suddenness as as the Great Migration, but um, reverse migration certainly is a phenomenon. So some folks have been talking about um, the book by Isabella Isabel Wilkerson, uh, Warmth of the Sun, um, and I wonder if you could speak to that. Um, I think for many of us, that was the first time we really heard about the Great Migration, and if you could speak to that book. Yeah, I mean, this is a book that really sort of focuses on a handful of people uh, and their, their stories in, in the Great Migration. And I think the book is a reminder, you know, that particular approach is a reminder that there are just so many struggles of, I'm sorry, so many stories emerging out of the Great Migration. Um, there are so many people whose names we know, um, and I've, you know, or, or people who are famous, who I've mentioned, who whose lives were uh, transformed by the Great Migration, and then they went on and did really um, uh, achieved important things and transformed um, American society. And I think it's it's a reminder that this is a human story, that this is not just a question of demographics uh, of of numbers, but this is a story uh, in which people, um, you know, they they reached a point at which they decided that they could not live under an oppressive system uh, and, uh, or could not, or maybe, you know, fled uh, the South or had to flee the South, uh, you know, being pursued by white mobs after having had an altercation with, uh, you know, a, a, a white person of authority. So there are just so many stories like that. And those stories are in, the lore of of African American families, uh, and and I think Wilkinson's approach uh, of of really um, telling these sort of really fine grained human stories about the migration, um, you know, makes that book uh, so powerful and profound. Great, thank you. And just our final question, and 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 just someone is asking. So for is there data or just sort of in a ballpark, how many black families that migrated north fared economically and socially compared to black families that stayed in the south? I mean, what's the general consensus on that? Yeah, I mean, that that's a, that's a that's a difficult question. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm sure that we could go back in the census and look for for changes in the um, the median income of African Americans, but I I think you could probably say that the Great Migration had an impact in the sense that African Americans are moving in substantial numbers to industrial cities like Detroit. Um, they're working in defense production during World War II. They're working in the automobile industry, automobile industry before that, and you know they are um, certainly um, enjoying the social mobility uh, offered by the um, you know the automobile industry, uh, defense production, and so I, I think it, it's hard to make that kind of comparison, but I would have to think that. Um, the the Great Migration and the number, the sheer number of African Americans in, involved in um, industrial jobs, manufacturing jobs uh, that could support a family. I mean, in my family history, my grandfather moved from Birmingham, Alabama to Cleveland in, during World War II, um, and uh, they were able to afford a very nice three-story house in Cleveland um, you know, where I spent part of my childhood, uh, and, you know, my grandparents, you know, they raised, uh, you know, six sons and did, did pretty well. So I, I, I think that's just, uh, my personal and anecdotal and response to that question. Great. You know, unfortunately our, our hour is up, but thank you so much, uh, Professor Gaines, uh, for this wonderful presentation.
Uh, we are receiving comments that people are, have learned so much and we really thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with UVA Lifetime Learning this afternoon. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I'm gratified by all of the uh, the applause uh, icons that are and uh, <laughs> that are that are rising out of my Zoom. So yeah, absolutely. thanks, thanks everyone for uh, for showing your appreciation. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, and thank you to Professor Gaines. Uh, you know, I always learn so much from our faculty, and it sparks my curiosity to learn more. So I want to take a moment and bring an upcoming lifetime learning program to your attention please consider signing up for the April virtual symposium entitled Building a New Nation, the role of four Virginia presidents. This symposium consists of five different virtual sessions over three days on April 12th, 18th, and 19th. This virtual spring symposium will highlight the first four Virginia presidents and how they grapple with, grappled with the problems associated with birthing a nation and creating and maintaining a democracy. So you can check out that program and all of our lifetime learning programs, our podcast library, and our UVA Speaks podcast series to watch and listen to our expert UVA faculty. You can find all lifetime learning events and online resources at our website at engagement.virginia.edu forward slash learn. So thank you so much for joining us for this hour of learning, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and evening. Thank you.